Good evening, everybody. My name is David Lviv, a campus advisor at Camera on Campus. I'm excited that you're joining us for this event, both on Zoom and also on Facebook Live, to celebrate the stories of Mizrahi Jews um, with students at UC Davis. I'm very excited in a moment to introduce our great camera fellow, Adam Buskila, who will be moderating this discussion and having this conversation with all of us. But before we do, I just want to thank everyone who's participated in all of our Mizrahi Stories events throughout the month, and we hope you enjoy this event. Without further ado, I'll pass it along to Edin. Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming out to my event tonight, and I really appreciate that you took the time out of your Wednesday evening to stop by. Um, I have to give a special thank you to Camera and AFI for helping me put this event together. Um, and without further ado, let's begin our discussion between Mizrahi voices. So. <clears throat> okay, can everyone see my screen? Are you guys seeing this? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So what are Mizrahi Jews? Uh, Mizrahi Jews are the Jews that fled to Middle Eastern nations during the Jewish diaspora after we were exiled by the Romans from Eretz Israel in approximately 135 CE. Uh, Mizrahi Jews include Jews from Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Yemen, Libya, and many other Eastern countries. Uh, these maps provide a good visual on where Mizrahi Jews may come from. What is Mizrahi culture? Uh, Mizrahi culture was heavily influenced by the nations that Mizrahi Jews lived in at the time. Uh, for this reason, Mizrahi culture is extremely diverse as it spans from regions such as North Africa to Kafkaz to Afghanistan. And this is also why many Mizrahi Jews may know some Arabic, uh, may listen to Arabic music, and may eat foods similar to Arabic foods. Um, this is also why you probably will not find gefilte fish on a menu at a Mizrahi Israeli restaurant, but you will find foods like this. Um, here we can see foods such as boekas, shakshuka, couscous, kurze, which is a Kafkazi dish, and pita with hummus. Um, these foods are extremely prominent in Mizrahi households and were a staple part of my diet as a kid. Uh, <clears throat> I am sure that many of the other panelists can relate to this, and I am excited to discuss their experience with Mizrahi food and their upbringing. Another vital factor of culture is fashion and clothing. In these photos, you can see some patterns. Mizrahi Jews who resided in Arab countries generally wore a sudla and a robe. A sudla is a headdress for those who don't know. And in the bottom picture, we can see a Yemeni Jewish couple in their wedding attire. Uh, this is a style of wedding attire, which is relatively common for Yemeni Jews. Um, in these photos, you can really get an understanding of the contrast between Mizrahi versus um, Ashkenazi fashion. Uh, Ashkenazi clothing is generally much more modern looking, such as black suit jackets with white button up shirts for men and long skirts for women. Finally, the last piece of culture that I would like to discuss personally is music. Uh, Mizrahi music is very popular in Israel and it is kept alive by many Mizrahi artists, such as Kobe Peretz, Eyal Golan, and the Revivo Project. Um, it is very common to hear similar melodies, tunes, and instruments in their songs as you would hear in Arabic music and I highly recommend you check them all out. Uh, now that we have some background on Mizrahi culture, um, we can begin our panelist introductions. I can start. Uh, my name is Eden. I'm a second year economics major at UC Davis, and my background is Egyptian. And whichever panelist would like to go next can go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Asanipour. I'm a fourth year uh, psychology major, and my background comes from Iran. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle. I'm also a fourth year, I'm a poli-sci major, and I'm also from Iran. Hi, my name is Nora Faradel. I'm a second year English and communication major, and I'm from Iran. Hi everyone, I'm David again, and um, I am not a student anymore. I graduated from West Virginia University four years ago, but I am uh, happy to be here with all of you. And I am a Kafkazi Mountain Jew. Okay. So this brings us to question one, which asks us, uh, what is your family story? 
what is your story and did this influence any of your customs, food or music? Uh, whichever panelists would like to go first may go ahead. Yes, I'll just go ahead. Um, my my father uh, was from a city in Iran called Shiraz, and uh, he came to the U.S. with his brother uh, to escape the 1979 revolution. And my mother comes from the capital of Iran, Tehran, and she also came to uh, Los Angeles in the U.S. to escape from the revolution, and they met together and had me. Um, and the Iranian, I'm very in tune with the Iranian culture since, you know, they are immigrants and it's very, it's a part of my day-to-day -day life. I listen to a lot of Iranian music. Um, and as well as that, I listen to, um, Mizrahi music, such as Arabic and Israeli music. And there's a lot of, uh, traditions around, uh, the Iranian culture that I follow to this very day. And there's a lot of good food that, uh, Persian food that I also eat. So it's very influential. I can continue. Um, so my parents are both from Tehran, but they didn't know each other. My mom came to the United States. She came to Los Angeles with her family when she was nine years old. And my dad came alone to, uh, to Los Angeles when he was 14, um, because it was very difficult for people to immigrate from Iran at the time. Um, and he was able to secure a student visa. Um, and he basically immediately went to the first synagogue he could find and the rabbi set him up with a Jewish foster family. Um, and he hopped from Jewish foster family to foster family until he was able to reunite with his family in adulthood in the US. Um, so obviously it's a very important story to me. And being Persian has absolutely influenced my culture and my customs. Um, every Shabbat, we eat Persian food. We listen to Persian music at weddings. Like um, a personal favorite is Arash, if you know him. Um, and you know, my parents speak Farsi to me, so it's it's still very ingrained, and I think in one with my Jewish culture. Um, like for example, there's specific Persian Jewish foods like gondi, which is like a Persian version of matzo balls. Okay, I'll continue. Um, my parents both grew up in Tehran and my dad went to college in Italy, like right before the revolution. And my mom, like my mom lives through it and they eventually met and got married and like lives in Italy for a couple of years and eventually came to LA. Um, yeah, and it influences like my whole life like my mom makes Persian food every week um I listen to Persian music I speak Farsi to my parents it's just like everything yeah continuing on um from my family story so both sides of my family are Kavkazi most of my family is from Dagestan which is a republic within the Russian Federation so uh, my family's distinct uh, honor of being one of the three Sephardic communities, Mizrahi communities that also speak Russian. Um, both of my family stories run through Israel before coming to the United States. My father's family, which some are from Dagestan, some are from other republics within Russia near uh, Dagestan, uh, left in the 70s and went to places like Israel and Italy. And my father is actually a Sabra. He was born in Israel before they moved to Brooklyn, New York. My mother's side, Grew up in uh, Derbent, mostly in Derbent, some people in places like Makachkala as well. Um, and my mother's family left in the early 90s to make Aliyah to the state of Israel. Not long after, my mom um, moved to the United States and married my father. Um, so for the most part, my, my experience has been American. Um, I am Israeli-American despite not being a Sabra. Um, so that's had a lot of influence on me and also my Mizrahi story as a whole, but I think the parts that have really impacted me culturally have been, uh, the music, uh, there's a, there's a dance in the, in the caucuses, not just, uh, amongst the Jewish community, but the Muslim populations there called Vizginka. If you've ever seen a wedding video of Kafkazi Jews getting married, the Vizginka is one of the most famous, uh, ones that you'll see in Israel and in the U.S., Food-wise, uh, Eden mentioned uh, kurze, which is a Kafkazi food. Definitely love that. Love foods like chibareki as well, and hudo, 
and a lot of other great foods. And I grew up with this. And while uh, for the most part, I was not super close to my culture when we left New York to move to the South, um, the traditions at home kept me connected to my community. And later when I wanted to get that deeper connection, um, those traditions at home helped me branch out. Yeah, and I can uh, actually conclude with my own. Um, so my grandparents were from Cairo. They lived in Cairo and Egypt. And eventually when the state of Israel was reestablished, they moved to Israel, um, had my parents um, separately. And then my parents met in Israel, moved to the U.S. and had me. So I was born in California. And even though I never lived in Israel, I would definitely say that it influenced my customs, my food and my music. Um, much like the other panelists, I grew up eating like Mizrahi foods, like shawarma and falafel and pita and hummus and all this kind of stuff. And even today, I still listen to primarily Mizrahi music. It just reminds me of home and it makes me happy. And I think it's nice that it has had so much influence on me despite me not living in Israel. And this will bring us to our next question, um, which asks, uh, do you think being a Mizrahi Jew influenced your worldview? And how do you think your perspective is different compared to an Ashkenazi or Sephardi Jew? Um, so whoever would like to go first can go ahead. I can start off um, here just because my perspective is a little different than I think from even most Mizrahi Jews. Um, being Kafkazi means I have ties to multiple different historic cultures. Kafkazi Jews, after leaving the land of Israel, originally went to Persia. So there's the Persian connection to the Jewish community um, in, in the Kafkaz. For example, we speak Juhuri. Um, our, our communities did for, for hundreds of years, and that's a language mix between Farsi and Hebrew. So in one way, I'm very connected. Historically, our community is very connected to that aspect of it but also living in what is now the former Soviet Union. My family was Russified in a lot of ways. So I have a bit of a connection to some Ashkenazi Jews who lived in the Soviet Union. Um, so for me, it's kind of like being in between worlds, but compared to the average American Jew who's never heard of a Kafkazi Jew, the first thing people ask when they hear Kafkazi Jew is, uh, or Mountain Jew, they think Mountain Jew, um, or ask if I'm just a Russian Jew with a slight tan. Um, those are definitely some things I've heard. So it's been interesting navigating those different perspectives. And I think it helps me really bond with other Mizrahi Jews, but also Ashkenazi Jews, having that place kind of in the middle of the table culturally. Um, and I, I think that for me has been special. I can um, add to that. Yeah, I think it's definitely within the Jewish community. I feel solidarity, solidarity with other Mizrahi Jews because I think a lot of us are, you know, first generation American um, and we kind of have like Jewish struggle ingrained in us and therefore we have Jewish pride ingrained in us. So um, my family, like growing up was always like, well, we had to fight to be Jewish. We had to fight to retain our culture. And um, so I have always kept that close to heart. And, um, and I, it's always in the back of my heart and Judaism is very important to me. Um, in another vein, like, I don't necessarily see Mizrahi culture as much as I see other like strains of Judaism. Um, there's not much representation, I think, in the mainstream. We talk about this notion of like Ashkenaz normativity, which is this idea that like Jewish mainstream media uh, is dominated by Ashkenazim, um, which is like European diaspora Jews. So like when I'm watching t TV and stuff, I don't necessarily relate to like the marvelous Mrs. Maisel or like people who talk about eating kugel growing up or speaking Yiddish when they were growing up. These aren't really experiences that I relate to. So it's definitely made me feel that much more of a strength and solidarity with um, other Persian Jews and other like Mizrahim in my life. Yeah, going off, oh. going off uh, what Danielle said, um, I think it's a really important point to make is that not every Jew grew up eating matzo ball soup and kugel. In fact, I had no idea what kugel was till like six months ago. And it's it's really interesting to to think how, it's amazing that it shows the diversity of the Jewish world, but it's also important to recognize that that exact diversity, that Jews are not a monolith. We didn't grow up eating the exact same food everywhere. 
um, we are scattered in the world right now in the diaspora. And because of that, we grew up in many different ways. So I would say that that absolutely influences my worldview as to um, what being Jewish means to me. Uh, I'd like to add on to that. Like, I also did not know what Google was until I had it at Hillel, I think sophomore year. Um, so I also did not really, I could like relate with Danielle. Like I did not grow up knowing any of the Ashkenazi customs. Like I didn't know that there was really like, I like knew there was much of like a huge difference. And, uh, but I think going back to the first question, I feel like being a Persian Jew, especially in LA, um, has definitely influenced my worldview because it's such a tight bubble and there are so many different customs and values that this culture places on all of us as Persian Jews um, that just make us see the world in a different lens. Um, like when I came to Davis, it was very, uh, it's like a huge uh, culture shock to me to see different Jews from different backgrounds who like, you know, some are uh, from come from uh, their Ashkenazi, some are from, they're Sephardic, and it was just amazing to see all of the, the diversity. Um, but I definitely think that being a Persian Jew and being Mizrahi has definitely impacted the way I like view the world. Um, adding on, I agree with what everyone said. Like, I definitely think that being from Iran caused my parents to like hold on tighter to their Judaism because it was something that was like not really accepted before and like my whole family like it was just as much of a cultural thing as being Persian and I definitely felt the Persian Jewish bubble in LA too because I also just like didn't like growing up I didn't even know it was not like the norm to be a Persian Jew like I was so in this bubble that I thought it was like I just thought it was like everything and I didn't like realize there were like that many it was just like a whole thing and like coming to Davis it was definitely like an eye-opener and like just like realizing that there are like so many different strains to Judaism like even just like going to different temples um yeah so I think like culturally being a Persian Jew gives me like a totally different perspective like celebrating holidays in different ways and just like it's just like very specific and yeah i also didn't eat kugel until recently <laughs> okay uh good answers from everyone that will bring us to question three which asks um is there something you want the world to understand about mizaki culture and do you feel like the world around you takes your background into account so i can i can start on this one um by saying that I feel like the world doesn't really even know what it means to be Jewish. And, you know, even further than that, you know, there is no context around what it means to be a Mizrahi Jew. Um, a lot of people today um, think of a Jewish person and they think of some Lithuanian guy with a fur hat. And it's like, no, like I, I have no one in my family who resembles that. You know what I mean? And of course, we share our Jewish um, culture, we share our Jewish religion and our values, but our background is is relatively different, and it's different enough to take into account, and I feel like, unfortunately, today, that's really, really overlooked, and I'm wondering if you guys feel the same way or have a conflicting idea, or what do you think? I can uh, start here. Um, from my perspective, as the uh low non-student here, um, having experienced both having my background taken into account and both not having it taken into account. So when I was in college, and, and that makes me sound definitely a little older, it's only four years ago, I promise. Um, when I was in college, I definitely did not feel my Kafkazi heritage had much room to grow. Um, a lot of my friends, and it's not their fault, kind of just said, oh, well, you speak Russian, so we're just going to say you're a Russian Jew. And for a while, I kind of went with that because, you know, especially in a place like West Virginia, um, there's not too many Jews, period, yet alone Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews or even, even for Russian-speaking Jews. Um, but 
you know, and I realized as time went on, like the longer I let people define my identity and my experience in the Jewish world for me, the more isolated I felt when I graduated. Like in college, I was kind of content, you know, being in this weird middle space where it wasn't necessarily my culture that was being attributed to me, but going into the professional world, I was like, hey, people are talking about the communities in the broader Mizrahi tent. And sometimes I'd hear people talk about Kafkazi Jews if they've heard of our community. Um, and I, I wanted to be a part of that conversation in the professional world and in the broader Jewish world post-college. Um, I definitely feel like my voice and my communal background has been taken into account more because I've been a little bit more assertive in expressing it. Um, it's easier to, and I would bring culture into it, you know, Sarit Haddad and Omer Adam vote for Kafkazi. And, you know, I think while most Americans don't know any Israeli singers, if they know any Israeli singers, Omer Adam is usually near top of the list and that opens a lot of conversations up. Um, so being in a professional world, I definitely feel like I've had my room to grow as a Mizrahi Jew, as a Sephardic Jew, as a Kafkazi Jew. Um, there are definitely still barriers, I think, that need to be, you know, pushed down. And I think, you know, having panels like this really help um, explore those boundaries. And I know for me, one thing that really helped me push my own barriers down to explore it was when I went to APAC in uh, 2015. And I heard a conversation about geopolitics in the caucus. I would never thought in America, anyone would even care about the caucus, about places like Azerbaijan or the, uh, Armenia or Georgia or any of those places. And, and that really opened the door for me to be proud of my background and to kind of not make people take my background into account, but be a little bit more assertive and be, you know, have a little bit more, um, a little bit more uh, excitement about my community and bringing it to the table. Yeah, I can add on to what David said. I think that there's, and he kind of explained this, there's definitely an, an educational divide, um, not just within the Jewish community, but within the greater community about what Jews look like. Um, when we talk about Israel, it, one of the misconceptions is about like a white colonial power coming in and taking over the Middle East. And something that people don't understand about Israel is that, you know, greater than 50% of Israel is Mizrahi Jews. Um, who have lived there and who their descendants have lived there, um, you know, their entire existence. Um, and so I think that's really important is to understand that not all Jews are the same and to understand the diversity within the Jewish community and how that shapes um, not just our own lives and our own culture, but how it, cha it shapes like geo geopolitical um, politics and ideologies and things like that. And, um, and also that you know, representation is really important. Um, Nora talked about living in like a Persian Jewish bubble in LA. I didn't live in like proper city LA. So I wasn't my, I wasn't really in the like Persian Jewish bubble. A lot of my friends were more like Israeli. Um, so I didn't have like Persian friends growing up for the most part. Um, so like for me growing up, I know like a lot of people, especially when I went to college, like finding out that I was Persian and finding out that I was Jewish, like asked me, oh, did you convert to Judaism? And I think that a lot, even like Jews ask me that. So I think that I would like the world to have a better understanding of diversity of Jews and, and not just specifically my community, but I know like I wanna learn and I hope that everyone else learns a lot more about Ethiopian Jews, Ghana Jews, uh, Jews from different communities, um, even to some degree like Sephardim, there's not a lot of education about them too. So. Um, definitely like bridge an educational divide, but also um, talk about how, like I sort of spoke earlier, like how Jewish pride comes into play in, um, in my, not just like my culture, but in how I approach the world because of my background. Uh, I can add on to a little bit of what Danielle said. Uh, I also, whenever I, uh, I also feel like that a lot of people don't realize that there are, there's like a lot of diversity. Um, a personal experience I had was when I was on birthright, I uh, was in a taxi and uh, I said, yeah, we're Persian Jews. And the taxi driver looked back in disbelief that we were Persian. And he's like, how are you guys Persian? Like, how is this possible? Uh, did you guys convert? Um, so it was just, 
very interesting to see that even in Israel, like the land of the Jews, that like there's like not a lot of knowledge about like different types of people. Um, so yeah. Um, adding on to what everyone said, I definitely think there is an educational gap. Like even growing up in LA, I it was like never something I had to think about really because like I knew that everyone knew there was a huge Persian Jewish community but like looking back it definitely was a gap because like I didn't I didn't go to school with Persians so a lot of the times when I would say I was Jewish people would be surprised but I didn't like process it in the moment and yeah so like I think people definitely need to realize Judaism is a lot more like widespread and global than they think and yeah nice like all these answers very good variety of opinions and at the same time we can reach a general consensus that there is definitely an educational divide um, in the world today regarding what a Mizaki Jew is and we will now move on to question four which asks where do you feel like you fit in best in the world and do you feel comfortable being a Mizaki Jew in America um, I can start on this one as well uh, I do feel comfortable in the U.S. I've never necessarily felt like physically unsafe here for my background. Uh, that being said, again, we can bring up this problem with education is that like not a lot of Americans know what being Jewish really means and especially not what uh, a Mizrahi Jew is. So sometimes I do kind of feel like an alien on campus or in my hometown. And I think that's a big problem that must be addressed. Um, in one way or another through, you know, the education system or uh, programs like this and panels like this, which can help educate the public on what Mizaki Jews are. So while I don't necessarily feel um, physically uncomfortable in the U.S. with my background, uh, I would still say that I fit in here as I am someone who was born here. That being said, I also feel like I would fit in very well in Israel if I made Aliyah, if I moved. Um, I do think that in a few years after moving, I would essentially adapt and feel like an Israeli, but um, I still feel like in the overall, uh, the U.S. has been a relatively good home for a Mizrahi Jew, um, but Israel can also be a fantastic choice. I can add, um, I often think about this question, it's a loaded question, um, because we sort of talked about before, like, I don't know if I 100% fit into like the wider Jewish community because I'm Mizrahi, but then I don't necessarily fit into the wider Persian community because it's very like dominated by Muslim culture. Um, so trying to toe the line between these two cultures that I personally believe are intrinsically um, you know, <laughs> put together that um, it's it's difficult, but I, I mean, I've never felt unsafe in America. I've never really felt unsafe in Israel. I hope one day in the future, I can go to Iran and experience it because that would be amazing. My parents talk about it all the time. Um, but like, I mean, I feel physically safe here. I don't really have an issue with that. Um, it's just more about like the norms of society and creating a place where everyone feels represented, I think. Uh, I could add on to that. Um, I also really would like to go to uh, Iran um, one day to like see how um, like the community is there. My parents also always talk about it. Um, personally, based on like, I feel like I'm a very adaptable between um, kind of like the different types of uh, cultures. Um, I, I feel comfortable, but I only recently started feeling comfortable like physically. I like, it, like when I first came to like Davis, um, I remember the Imam, he said some stuff about like killing the Jews. So I was very, uh, physically at that time, I did not feel safe. I did not really tell people that I was Jewish. I kind of just told people I was Persian. Uh, but then over time, I just learned to like, I started recently wearing like Star of David and stuff. But um, now I feel physically safe. And uh, yeah. 
Adding on, I definitely want to go to Iran too. Um, I've never felt like uncomfortable being a Jew in America. Like I definitely recognize my privilege in being here and like how much was sacrificed so that I could feel comfortable. Um, yeah, and I've like never really felt like I've tried to hide it necessarily, but I definitely have felt a shift when I came to college. Um, yeah, I guess in like the greater scope of like the Jewish community, it's like kind of hard to fit in, but I'm kind of lucky that I like live in LA and it doesn't feel a big of a deal. But like, even though like me living in America is like such a big shift from like what my parents experienced, like there's definitely like always progress to be made. And yeah. Continuing um, from, from my perspective, it's an interesting question for me. I've always felt American, um, kind of touching on what Nora uh, mentioned, you know, I, I understand the absolute privilege of being born in the United States and then realizing the sacrifices my family made um, coming to America and, you know, building up their livelihoods in New York and in North Carolina and then being able to send me to college, being a first generation college graduate. Um, but I've always felt a bit of a tug between the United States and Israel for me personally, be, you know, Israel has always been central to my family's identity and to the Kafkazi community as a whole. Kafkazi Jews have been making Aliyah to the land of Israel since the 1860s. Um, so there's always been that tie to the land and the state of Israel. Within the American context, I've, for the most part, I've always felt safe in America. The last few years have been a bit unnerving personally um, with some of the things going around in our country. Um, but uh, I also still feel like America is one of the better diasporas today for, for Jews. Um, but when it comes to like the Kafkaz homeland, I've only recently wanted to start exploring, visiting those places. Um, my, my mom's side and, my, and a lot of my dad's side lived in, you know, in Dagestan or Cabardino, Balkaria. I want to visit those places, though maybe not the safest places in, in Russia to visit right now, unfortunately. Uh, but I do want to also visit uh, Krasnaya Sloboda, which is a red town in Azerbaijan. It's one of the last places in the world that's an all Jewish settlement outside of America or Israel. Um, so I do want to experience the rich culture, the religious, you know, spiritual center for Kafkazim in, in that area. Um, but one thing that has really brought me comfort and, and brought all of these identities together has really made me feel comfortable with my recent embrace the last five years of, of my Kafkazian Mizrahi identity have been uh, connecting with the Buharian Jewish communities, the Georgian Jewish communities, and also the Persian Jewish communities. Um, uh, and people I've met from these communities the last five years. And it's made me feel more comfortable in the broader Jewish space. Um, so while America, for the most part, I've always felt safe, um, within the Jewish space, I feel like the last few years, I've definitely found my place. Um, I've always been involved. I was president of Chabad in college. I was, you know, I'm a proud AEPI alumni. I started the Israel Club at my campus. Um, but I think today I feel much more grounded in my place in the Jewish community, partially because of the ties I've been forging with other members of the Mizrahi world. Yeah, and, and going off a part of what David said, um, it is indeed getting harder to, in fact, it's getting harder to be a Jew in America. It's not, it's actually not getting easier. I would not say that it's getting easier. Um, maybe as I, as I mature, it's easier, but Relative to the events that go on in America, uh, we see today that Jews are one of the most targeted groups of hate crimes, and it is getting worse. Um, and this shows that although in my current situation today, right now, at this second, I feel okay here, in a year or in two years or in three years, that could totally change. Um, and that's why I emphasize to myself that if it ever gets bad enough, I, I don't have real connection to the land here I you know what I mean like I, as much as I was born here and I, I grew up here I don't feel really connected per se as like a like 100% American I do think that I could very easily adapt to living in Israel and for that reason I've always told myself that if it got bad enough I would move just because it's safer um, it's more secure for the Jewish people 
and in the long run, it could be a good move. Um, but that will bring us on to question five. Um, do you think there needs to be more Mizrahi rep uh, representation in the world? And what would you change about the world's view on Mizrahi Jews today? This is also our last question before the Q&A part of the panel, um, just so everybody knows. So you can prepare your questions if you're a guest, and if you were a panelist, you can prepare your answers. I can uh, start here. Um, do I think there needs to be more representation for Mizrahi Jews? Yes, I think there definitely does, um, particularly in the diaspora. In Israel, of course, there's still some gaps that need to be bridged, but I think you're seeing a lot of the rich Mizrahi culture the last 20, 30 years really start to flourish in Israel, whether it's through music, film, other cultural rounds in Israel and the diaspora, I think there's still a little bit of a ways to go, but I'm really proud to say in my personal life, and I've seen it happen for other Mizrahi Jews, being a Jewish professional, camera has been extremely supportive of my Mizrahi my identity and, and, you know, doing the whole Mizrahi Jewry social media campaign. Um, I've also said from the many Jewish groups that have been involved in my life as a student and later an activist in the pro-Israel space. Um, there's a lot of diversity in our camera fellows. Um, we have, I know, a few other fellows who are, who are watching as attendees who are of Mizrahi descent as well. And I, that was one of the first things that crossed my mind when I started working for camera. But even before camera, when I worked at the Boston Federation, I had um, an amazing mentor who's also on this call, thank you, Cheryl, um, for, for viewing, um, who really supported me in exploring my identity and helping other Jewish students explore their identity, whether it was Sephardic, Mizrahi, Ashkenazi, Ethiopian, um, other identities. So I think, you know, we're starting to see that become a priority. And I think it's a very positive step. And I think for, for this generation of students in Gen Z, you're gonna only see that increase and, um, but of course, as some of you have mentioned, we need to be more assertive. We need to continue pushing um, for representation because if, if we don't, if we don't uh, express ourselves, nobody will express themselves for us. But um, what I would change about the world's view of Mizrahi Jews today, uh, that it's complex. Uh, that's, that's what I think is important to note. Um, Mizrahi Jews represent such a massive umbrella group of people uh, in the world. You have Jews from the Arab world, you have Jews from the Caucasus, Jews from the Central Asia, Jews from uh, Iran, Jews from the former Ottoman Empire. And then you add in the Sephardi element, you know, you also have Syrian Jews, as, you know, Jews of Spanish or Portuguese descent. It is such a massive catch-all term. Um, so just understanding that Mizrahi identity as an umbrella term is very awesome, it's very beautiful, but Getting to know these cultures individually, um, I think, is super, super important. Um, and understanding, you know, the depth of diversity in the Jewish world. I can continue. Um, I absolutely think there needs to be more Mizrahi representation. Um, I am a huge cinephile. I love watching movies. And I would love to see Mizrahi Jews um, on TV, that's a small thing, but I feel like it's still important um, because I think it helps change the worldview of like what what people see first and foremost in the mainstream media is um, how they see the world a lot of the time. So I think that's important. I also think that like within the Jewish community, um, there needs to be like a reconciliation that a lot of the most important aspects of Jewish culture came from Mizrahim. So like Passover is a holiday about Egyptian Jews. Purim is a holiday about, you know, ancient Persian Jews. These are like some of my most beloved holidays. And um, I think it's beautiful that Mizrahi Jews have shaped so much of Jewish culture. And I think that like David said, we need to be more of a priority and we need to be brought to the table in discussions about Judaism, Jewish culture, Israel, politics, things like that. Um, so what would I change about the world's view? Um, I, like we've said over and over again, like the educational divide, I, I want people to meet Mizrahim and not like second guess our identity as Jews, um, not, just, not just Persian Jews, not ones that like look like us, but also like, um, like I said before, Ethiopian, Ethiopian Jews oftentimes get their Jewish identity questioned and that, that's unfair. Um, so, I think 
we need to start understanding that Mizrahi Jews are part of are a priority in Jewish culture and, are, and a big part of what makes Judaism great. Uh, just going off a little bit off that, um, I just think that in the Jewish community, you know, uh, there does, there has to be more representation. Uh, I would agree with everything that Danielle says. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to just pass this. Okay, adding on. I definitely think there needs to be more representation. It's basically non-existent in like all of the media. And I think it would be a good step forward. Um, if I were to change the worldview on Mizrahi Jews, I would definitely just say to be more open-minded and welcoming. Because if anything, like Mizrahi Jews just like incorporates way more Jew like culture into Judaism which is like amazing and there are like so many more things to be recognized than like kugel and like schwitzing like there's so much more to Judaism than people know and it could benefit everyone to learn more I really like all these answers and I totally agree. Um, again I'll bring up that I want to shift the worldview of a Jewish person um the idea of a jewish person so again many people today think of a jewish person and they think of some guy from brooklyn or, or you know some part of new york or lithuania or whatever it may be when in reality it could be a guy from iran or iraq or yemen or israel and like that's okay too and it's okay to see a jew in that way as well and i think that's something that like seriously needs to be changed and uh, one more issue that i have with the view on mizrahi jews today is um for example you can be eating falafel at home and post a picture of your falafel and someone's like oh that's arab you're stealing culture you're erasing arab culture and it's like no like my people live there as well and we adopted some foods and that's okay i'm not erasing anyone's culture i'm just eating something that my family eats often and that's okay um i think it's silly to claim that something is an appropriation just because you're eating a certain food. Um, and I think that, again, the world needs to open up its eyes and understand that Mizrahi Jews do have a lot in common with Arabs. That doesn't mean they're Arabs. It just means that they're Mizrahi Jews and they live in the same communities as Arabs did for, a, you know, a long time. And that's okay. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean erasure. Um, and that being said, if no one else has anything to add, we can now move on to our Q&A part of the panel. So if there are any questions from the guests, we can answer questions. Um, guests may direct the question specifically to like specific uh, panelists. And yeah, so let's see. Uh, let's see. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for the compliment. So Cheryl says, how can Mizrahi Jews help the Jewish community be more empowered to stand proud on campus during this challenging time for Jews on campus? Um, if anyone would like to tackle that before I do, go ahead. I'd love to answer this question. Um, so part of the way that I think a lot of Mizrahi Jews on our campus have really stepped forward is um, taking leadership roles in Jewish communities. So like Aggies for Israel, our board is, I think majority Mizrahi for the first time this year, which I'm so excited to see and are adding so much depth to the conversation that we are having, especially like this event tonight was put on by Mizrahi Jew from AFI. So I'm really excited about that. I think that um, it's good to it's good for Mizrahi Jews to stand up and be proud and, and empower other people by by saying you know if you're if you're talking about Jewish people one way if you're talking about Jews being like this European body colonialist whatever whatever then you're not understanding the depth of our community and the diversity of our community and I mean I know in my personal experience um, in previous years when I tabled with AFI on campus uh, back when you could table in person. Um, I would get a lot of people who would come up to our table and like call us white supremacists for representing Israel. And to that, I would always say, well, I'm Persian. My family com 
came from the Middle East. My ancestry, my identity, my DNA has traced back to the Middle East since the beginning of the time. Like you can check my 23andMe. Um, so I think it's important that we stand up and proud and we show like the world that the Jewish community is diverse and that people, there's always gonna be detra detractors. Yes, it's getting more unsafe for Jews in America, but um, you can't combat anti-Semitism with fear. You can only combat anti-Semitism with pride. Just to follow up on that, um, agreed with everything Danielle just said. Um, and just going off that, you know, um, having I've had the privilege of working with Jewish and non-Jewish students, um, high school, middle school, and college the last almost four years, um, I can tell you that when students lead from the front of all backgrounds, especially Mizrahi and Sephardi students, um, that's when, when our community as a whole is the strongest. Um, there's an article from the Jewish Journal I saw during the battle over California's ethnic studies curriculum, which I know has been a big hot topic of debate. And um, the, the professor who wrote it was uh, Saba Sumach. And, and the headline of the article is, it's time we talk about Iranian Jews in California's ethnic studies curriculum. And I really like this article um, because I think for a long time in the Jewish space, when we talk about defending Israel on campus and defending and strengthening the Jewish peoplehood, oftentimes we refer back only to the Ashkenazi story. Uh, but and, and that's important. There's a lot of important elements, especially in America, the contributions of Ashkenazi, it, it can't be ignored. But in California in particular, one of the big arguments that helped push back against some of these anti-Israel efforts and anti-Jewish efforts was introducing this story of Iranian Jews and introducing the story of Mizrahi Jews. And um, this comes from academics, it comes from students. So I think doing things like this, in, not only in California, but Miami has a growing and thriving Israeli, Mizrahi, Sephardi, Russian speaking community. New York City has a ton of Jewish diversity. Uh, when things come up on college campuses, that's where our diversity should be our strength and say, hey, you know, you can't demonize any aspect of the Jewish story, yet alone ones that you don't even know about. Um, so students and professors and teachers leading the lead on that for me has been deeply inspiring. In addition to our fellows, uh, of Mizrahi descent, many of whom like Eden have been putting up events like this or writing articles um, uh, about their experiences. And I think that really helps get more people out of their shell. And it's amazing to see that there are Israel clubs that are majority Mizrahi. Um, I think that's super important. And I think that's part of the solution. Um, I just have a little bit to say, but I would agree with the statement that we need to celebrate um, our diversity as Jews and the Jewish community and to show other people that, you know, we're not just white supremacists. Whenever I see that argument and, and like I hear people calling people who support Israel white supremacists, it kind of like rubs me the wrong way because um, I'm like a Persian Jew and I'm Middle Eastern and um, literally the Iranian regime like hates Jews. Like it just doesn't make sense to be called a white supremacist and there's like so much diversity. And I think if there's just more variation in uh, leadership positions as Danielle talked about, uh, touched upon, and just, we all celebrate the diversity it can push forward the narrative that like, you know, um, we're diverse, so yeah. Adding on, I agree that there's like, a lot of strength to be found in diversity and just like coming together as people from, that have different perspectives and different like that come from different struggles and like face a lot of different like version like not versions like types of anti-semitism like it's something that can create so much strength and shouldn't be ignored so yeah beautiful um, our next question is from Katrine. Sorry if I mispronounced that. She asks, what is your favorite tradition or holiday or food dish? Um, I can answer this one really quickly. Um, I love shakshuka. I could eat that all day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, I also love Passover. It's probably my favorite holiday. I always get the family to get together and I love uh, matzah and it's just a good time. Um, and if anyone else would like to answer that question, you can go ahead. 
Um, I'll just go ahead uh, really quickly. Um, there's this Persian dish that Danielle talked a little bit about. It's called gondi, and it's very specific to the Persian and Persian Jewish community. It's like kind of like this, uh, kind of like a matzah ball, a little bit, but it's like made out of chicken or like ground grounded chicken or grounded beef. And um, that's my favorite dish because my grandmother would make that for me every Shabbat. And every time it was Shabbat, you know, we'd all go to my grandma's house and she'd make her like gondi and she was really, really good at, she had an amazing recipe. Um, so yeah, like every time I like hold that dish very uh, close to my heart. And yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm hungry now that <laughs> Aaron's talking about his grandma's going deep, but um, yeah, I, I mean, every Shabbat, Shabbat is not complete with ta without Tadik, which is like the, like hard part on top of rice. I don't know how to explain it, but it's delicious. Um, all the different types of rice in Persian culture and of course Khoresh to go along with that. It's like a stew. Um, so that's definitely my favorite food. And I mean, it's not necessarily Jewish, but we have it every Shabbat. So it's Jewish to me. Um, and my favorite holiday is Purim because we love Esther. She's a woman, she's a Persian Jew. Um, and in the holidays about Jewish pride and about retaining your Judaism in the face of adversity. So, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Kluze is definitely one of my favorite uh, foods. Um, in Kafkazi culture, it's one of the more, no uh, the ones that people have actually heard of. So that's, that's a plus, but also anything that has meat in it for me and in dumpling style food is delicious. And I definitely echo uh, <laughs> that, that I'm hungry now too. It's always like this with these type of events. Uh, there's just so much beautiful food um, in the Sephardic and Mizrahi spaces. Um, I agree with the Gondi comments. It's definitely the best. It's like an elevated matzo ball. Um, my favorite holiday is like weirdly Yom Kippur because I feel like it just like, I don't know, I feel like it like cleanses my soul and like it just, I like that it forces me to be off my phone and like just like have very bare conversations. Yeah. If I could just quickly, I didn't touch upon like what my favorite holiday was, but um, I really like Yom Kippur as well. Um, because in LA, it's very, it was like, uh, whenever we go to service, it's just like, you see all of these Persian Jews and they're so united and like the way that they pray is like with passion. And there's so much like different tradi like traditions that they carry when they like carry the Torah. And it's just like, uh, kind of gives me chills. So I really, really like Yom Kippur. Yeah, just to touch upon that too, I didn't mention mine either. I also have to say Yom Kippur, for me, it's um, just a very solemn day where I can really focus in on the traditions of our peoplehood and, and Jewish history and understanding really the true meaning of the Day of Atonement. Um, but also because uh, usually I'm home for, for either Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah, um, just spending that time with family. And I'm not going to lie, it is kind of funny to try and watch how, how long some people in my family can fast because it's definitely a struggle for, for, for my family. Um, so that part's also a little bit of a guilty pleasure, but it's, it's such an important holiday. And I think, um, you know, everyone else has touched upon it. You know, just the passion of our peoplehood really shows through this holiday and the seriousness and the importance of it. I want to also interject real quickly. It's not my favorite holiday, but my favorite tradition from Passover is a, it's a Mizrahi. It might also be a Sephardi tradition, but we take Dayenu very seriously. Um, so, I mean, you should definitely look it up. It sounds weird, but like we like beat each other with leeks um, and it's, it's, it's a riot. <laughs> Yeah, I think the general consensus is that Mizrahim love to get together on Yom Kippur and complain about how hungry they are and all the food that they're going to eat when the fast is over. I think that's the uh, the general idea. Um, it looks like our final question is from an anonymous attendee, and they ask, um, 
How can someone who doesn't know anything about the Jewish community begin to learn and be an ally to the community, especially since it can be so diverse? And to that, I would answer, um, just be a friend. You know, you don't have to have a PhD in geopolitics to be a friend and an ally to the Jewish people. Um, you know, be fair, learn the context between the conflict today, um, religious and, and geopolitical conflict. And that's, that's all it really is. You know what I mean? It doesn't need to be a long drawn out process. Um, just be there. It's not something that should um, feel difficult. It should be fun. I'm always open to making friends and um, helping people learn about Jewish culture and Israeli culture. And if anyone else would like to chip in, uh, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I, I agree. Just be a friend, um, get multiple opinions about Israel, about Judaism, multiple perspectives. Um, if you really want to take a deep dive into Jewish history, there's obviously so many resources like My Jewish Learning, Camera on Campus, Stand With Us. If you go to UC Davis, come to AFI, come to Hillel. Um, there's so many different things, but I think listening is a big thing. If, if, you know, ask your friends about Judaism, ask about their personal experiences. If you know your friend is Mizrahi, like their experiences are gonna be different than the panelists here. Ask them like what their family story is, what's their favorite holiday um, and try to, I think just, yeah, listen. I agree with all of that and um, 100%. And something else that I think is really useful is uh, getting to know the storytellers of these communities the last five, 10 years, especially the last five years, we've seen prominent figures in the Mizrahi and Sephardi world um, rise up and, and they're very approachable and they're very friendly. Uh, just to name a few, uh, Henma Zig, of course, um, is very active on social media and with all of the great work that he does. Um, and then Menashe Chaimov is another one. He'll, uh, he's a Bukharian Jewish educator, very involved with Hillel, and I know he's big in New York. Ruben Shimonov is another one um, who's involved in Bukharian Jewish storytelling, and then also in the storytelling of LGBT Jews in the Mizrahi and Sephardi space. Valeria Nakshun is very involved in the Kafkazi storytelling world. Um, there's so many different people um, who are becoming prominent in storytelling and public speaking and all very friendly people, all very approachable. Um, and then also like others have said, just getting to know people in the community, getting to know the average person in the community um, and listening to them. And then, but, but as, as I always say, listening is a two way street. You know, the best way to build relationships is listen to another person's perspective and then that person listen to your perspective as well. Yeah, just to echo a little bit. Um what uh, what Eden, Eden said um just be a friend like there's no need to like um just like get be educated about all of the issues surrounding like Israel like hear multiple um opinions um perspectives but just just be, uh, the biggest thing is just be a friend like we're not like we're not like bad people like we're just we're all very like chill people I would I would say so yeah. Yeah. Adding on basically just what everyone else said, just like be open and listen. And like, I'm sure everyone like wants to tell their story and yeah, it's like a fun culture. It's a cool thing. Absolutely. It looks like that is all the questions from the guests tonight. Um, I want to again thank everyone for coming and thank you to AFI and camera for helping me put this event together. Um, I should mention I am running for ASUCD Senate and if you're an undergraduate UC Davis student in this call still, um, please vote for me. Tonight is the last night you can vote. Um, I'm going to bring emphasis to kosher and halal food sources on campus and hopefully bring some unity between Jewish and Muslim students on campus as well. Um, with that, again, thank you all for coming and that is the end of tonight's panel.